Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Gwetzi se hopa, hien weka ni me aset wat yats kutiete me osuta. And I have 20 minutes, so I'm going to keep an eye on time. But Libby, if I am getting close to time, please send me a chat. It's always hard to do the technology and talk and then watch the chat. So please just help me out and be patient with me. And before we get started, I just want to say it's an honor to be here with you all. And I'll get into a little bit about who I am, but I'm so honored to be here with you all. I served on the National Organic Standards Board for five years, and that was my deep dive into the organic community. Um, I've been part of indigenous communities my whole life, born and raised, um, but it was uh, such a fascinating experience to be have a deep dive into the organic community. So some of what I'm sharing with you today comes from those interactions and just from my experience working with indigenous people at First Nations Development Institute and being born and raised in one. And so when I first was approached about this topic, it was really fascinating to me because um, when we think about technology, um, when we think about agriculture and technology, we probably each get ideas about like computers or our smartphone or smart ag or automated ag. But really when I think about um, technology and agriculture, I think about what's happen happening presently. And this is um, Aaron Loden, one of my unsung heroes. And he said it best, he said, we are so old, we are new. So some of you may have seen the movie um, Kiss the Ground. It was, a, it was a movie that was on Netflix and it made its rounds and had a lot of commentary about um, you know, agricultural technologies and our understanding of soils. But a lot of these concepts are well known in indigenous communities and are practiced often. And so it was very odd to see a movie come out with um, the description of some of these practices when these are practiced widely in indigenous America. So the idea that we are so old, that we are new, um, really speaks to how I feel about this topic because some of our practices are now, now like the posh thing to do or the in, like we're the cool kids again, um, which carries its own baggage. And this is also um, Dr. Heber Brown, another one of my unsung heroes. And um, he uh, brought this quote to my attention. He put me on to this quote. And it says, the events which transpired 5,000 years ago, five years ago, or five minutes ago, have determined what will happen five minutes from now, five years from now, five thousand years from now, all history is a current event. And so when I'm going through my presentation, please keep that in mind, because one of the um, mainstays that I hear in um, agriculture technology, especially when we're talking about like maybe cryptocurrency, or when we're talking about Web3, or when we're talking about um, new forms of communication and socialization, one of the first things that is said is like, well, we can create our own world. We can create something new. Um, we spend a lot of time in all of these circles talking about the past and what has been done, but technology offers us the ability to do something new. But again, if we think of history as the present, as all history being current events, like we have to keep that in mind when, when those kinds of statements are made or when we're approaching systems um, with those ideals. And um, I'm Kochiti, 
and Kiowa. So Cochiti Pueblo is located in northern New Mexico. Um, it's high desert, so we don't get very much rain, 10, 10 inches on a really, really, really good year. Most of the time is probably two to three inches. And we've been farmers in this area for thousands of years. Of course, like history books want to put us there for at least 20,000 years. Um, and our people put us much later than that. And so um, we have uh, worked in this area and my homelands for thousands of years. This is a picture of my grandfather's um, cornfield and it's been in our generation for thousands of generations. Um, uh, Secretary Deb Holland in her bio, if you ever have a chance to read her bio, is pretty fascinating. She says she's um, 45th generation farmer. I don't know how far you have to go back to do 45th generation, um, but I still think we're probably older than that in this area as farmers. And I say that because as long as we've been, have had uh, communal memory, we've been farmers. But when we think about um, our current and present day conversations about where we see, see ourselves as a population and a humanity in the grand scheme of history, we are in the fourth um, agricultural revolution. The first one, you know, of course, was being hunters and gatherers to agriculture. And this is where we see most of this discussion around indigenous people um, as being like the hunters and gatherers. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna lay out these and then I'll go through how I actually feel about all of these, these agricultural revolutions. And then the second was the mechanization of agriculture the third was the Green Revolution, and now we're in the fourth. And what is interesting is that we have all these competing ideals about what this agricultural community or revolution would be. So in the 1970s and 1980s, we see like the organic movement. Um, we've seen more recently terms like sustainable agriculture. Um, we hear more recently terms like digital agriculture, and we're looking at things like urban agriculture. And of course, regenerative agriculture um, was around since probably the early 90s, but has really taken hold currently. And from an indigenous perspective, like all of these carry a lot of baggage, right? Because the, in, the, in the first revolution, indigenous people were pretty absent. Like we were the base, we were the primitive that became, um, you know, revolutionized or civilized through agriculture, which to me is a misnomer um, being that, you know, my own people were farmers for quite, quite, quite a long time. Um, the second agricultural revolution, you know, when it came to indigenous people, um, was really stark because this is where you see an erasure of indigenous agriculture because we, we were still considered primitive. And so when things like tractors or mechanization were introduced, they were brought to indigenous people and said, hey, you can have these things if you like send your kids to boarding school, which was an actual policy at one point. Um, and you know, even in my own community, the first time we had a steel hoe, and this is still told in my, in, in my uh, we still know who received that first hoe from um, the Americans when they came to our land in the late 19, I mean, late 1800s, excuse me. Um, they tried, the farmer tried to cut it in half so that more, more farmers could use that instrument. Like it was un unimaginable that just one hoe would serve one farmer. Like that is not how we normally did things. Um, the third agricultural revolution was the green revolution. And really this is where we see a lot of um, indigenous people being excluded because like the, the theme was like indigenous people don't do science. Like 
you know, they, they're, they're just over on the land being primitive. So when we're coming, when we're talking about the fourth revolution, knowing that all these arguments and all these circumstances excluded indigenous people, when we're talking about the fourth agricultural revolution, which is now, it's always important for me to try to orient myself to see where indigenous people are landing. And it doesn't look that great, to be quite honest. Um, we have like the agroecology movement, we have sustainable agriculture, even regenerative agriculture that takes indigenous practices and kind of repackages them and then um, retells the story, but really without the voice and the attachments to the people. And so um, that's problematic. And when we think about what, like really that should be a marker, um, the inclusion of indigenous people and in really like the orientation and the direction we would want to go. Of course, me being an indigenous person, like I, I would not sign on to any movement that didn't have indigenous people speaking for themselves. And I would hope others would react the same way. Um, so let's talk about regenerative agriculture. And I'm gonna take the definition from the Rodell Institute. And we did this whole, and to, uh, just to be honest, I tried to write a paper on regenerative agriculture and indigenous people, and it was really hard. And I had four other indigenous um, authors with me. And we decided that, you know, we just can't use the term. And we came up with our own term, which was concentric ecology, because one of the tenets of regenerative agriculture is that um, there, there's probably an economic component to what we're discussing. And sometimes the economic component is not a consideration in a lot of indigenous, like wholly indigenous systems. And so it creates a different orientation. Of course, I say that knowing that there's 575 different tribal communities. There's countless other communities that may not be attached to the tribe beyond that. And so there's many different models out there. Some of them are hybrids. Some of them um, are wholly in the capitalist food system. Some of them are not. And so I say that with that caveat. I'm trying to move my slides here. One second. OK. But you know, one of the critical parts of regenerative agriculture um, is soil regeneration and carbon sequestration, which is carries its own kind of irony um, in, in indigenous communities. When we talk about the Pacific Northwest, for example, one of the main stories uh, that often is told is that when farmers first came, uh, the in tribes, many of them thought it was forestry because one of the first things that um, agriculture did or settlers or people who wanted to farm was cut down all the trees. And this was like an incredible offense, especially when we think about how important these trees were not only to indigenous people, but how important they are to our waterways and how important they are to our soil. And so the idea that we are now talking about regenerative agriculture and soil regeneration, but not fully engaging in the conversation about how tree cutting was really like one of the key agricultural practices. Um, you, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a discussion that needs to be had. And second, when we think about even our current conversations about regenerative agriculture, agriculture is still pitted against like indigenous life ways. So you often see media pitting like car, um, salmon, salmon and dam construction against the needs of farmers. And in the indigenous eyes, like 
really what's good for the salmon and good for the river is going to be good for all of us. Um, and the allocations of water to agriculture in detriment to these systems is damaging to all of us. But the um, instigation of the two sided conversation um, is pretty damaging to both sides, in my opinion. And so um, another, and but we see like indigenous people constantly reiterating and reaffirming some of these traditional stewardship practices that should be included in regenerative agriculture. One of the questions that was asked to me at some point was like, why do you support basket weavers um, in regenerative agriculture? Like it has nothing to do with food. And um, I have to say, wait, 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 you have to understand. <laughs> basket weavers understand the part of the earth that not a lot of people understand. Basket weavers have to dig roots and understand root systems in ways that they, they create spans of prairies in order to create the most optimal root systems that would hold water in their baskets. And so in that traditional knowledge system, you have to understand the root systems of different plants. You have to understand plants themselves. You have to understand water absorption and you have to understand how to find these things. And so you have key ecological markers such as birds and trees that help basket weavers not only identify um, plants, but understand the health of those systems. And so if we're talking about soil sequestration and root communities like basket weavers probably hold the most key knowledge in some of the most natural systems and even can recognize when these systems are degraded by, by upstream activities, whether it be a farm or whether it be activities, they even have like traditional stories about where people used to get roots, but have now been uprooted for agricultural farms. And so when we think about agriculture in terms of the square or the fence or the row cropping, like we are being uncreative in how um, we're viewing these food systems. And of course, when we see things like fish on, you know, this is in response to the fish wars that happened in the late 70s, indigenous people, you know, got battered and beaten and thrown in prison for, for trying to protect the fish. We still see these on the banks of um, many of our rivers, fish on, and it's not commentary on um, colonization, it's, it's a cry for the protection of these ecological systems that protect all of our humanity. And so I have these group of um, old men sitting around talking story because that in itself too lends a lot of credence to traditional knowledge systems and how they're passed down. One of the um, key agitators for me in the conversation about regenerative agriculture is carbon itself. Um, when we think about who is counting the carbon, <laughs> Um, it's probably not going to be indigenous people. Like who actually counts carbon? It's probably people with instrumentation or knowledge of um, math equations that that include like dead, you know, dead plants versus the live ones. I mean, it's a pretty complicated way to look at the world because you have to measure carbon somehow, and already in that conversation about measurement, there are entire populations that are not going to be able to do that. And to me, it's like a form of gatekeeping. And so the over focus on carbon is pretty hard um, for me to, to sign up for. And so all of this to say there are very stark differences in how we talk about agriculture in general, like again, think about orientation and think about history and think about like how we've come to understand the terms as simple as agriculture, as simple as technology. 
And we're probably gonna come up with two very different perspectives. And some of those perspectives are, are, are listed here. Um, one of the most important things about working with natural systems and indigenous people is coming, is knowing that you're not gonna know everything. And that that unknown is part of the magic. That unknown is part of um, the special sauce that allows the human experience um, to see what we need to see. And you know, one of the Western approaches, like you have to know everything. You have to count your carbon molecules. You have to count like your um, water absorption rates. You have to measure these things in order for them to be valued. And of course, this measurement is um, all, we see it like constantly repeating itself, not only in like agriculture, we see it in the science field, we see it in, in um, philanthropy, how do we measure impact, all of these things. And so like, when we think about measurement, um, I would just invite people to pause and think about what that really means. Because if we're gonna get anywhere, like we have to be pretty creative in our measurement systems and what we actually mean by that. And um, again, I mentioned the paper that uh, we talked about. And so um, there, there's the link down there if you wanna look at it, firstnations.org. And um, I always get asked this. I think I'm coming up on my time. Yes, Libby? You're doing oh. good, you have a couple more minutes. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Um, what do indigenous people know about regenerative agriculture? And um, that is my look because I don't even know how to like even answer that question or start that conversation. And it's pretty overwhelming because we're, we have to discuss history, we have to discuss orientation, we have to discuss like different sy systems of measurement. I mean, it, it's a pretty overwhelming um, concept. So I think we need to really start by reframing. Um, Non-Indigenous people working within regenerative agriculture need to start including Indigenous history. Like, let's be real about agriculture history. Let's be real about what we mean when we talk about agriculture. Indigenous people were not included. And I say that coming from a community that has been farmers for thousands of generations, we weren't even included in what was considered a farmer. And really what we mean by that is like the dividing line between who was civilized and not. And unless we get real with about that kind of history, like we can't see beyond it. We're gonna consistently fall into the same pitfalls. And so when we talk about technology, not having roots in all the discussion about history, let's make sure that we don't repeat that history. So we do have to still talk about it, even if we're creating techn technological systems um, that are wholly new being created today. And um, this is Ishii. And if you don't know the story about Ishii, this is, um, it's a pretty important story, both for indigenous people and for non-Western people, because the way we talk about Ishii is two different, completely different ways. Ishii was the last Yahi. Well, the Western culture likes to say he was the last Yahi in California. Indigenous people say he, he's not the last, like he has relatives that still live on today. But the Western narrative is that he was like the last wild Indian and they had him on display at UC Berkeley. Um, but in all actuality, uh, indigenous people see his participation at UC Berkeley as a form of adaptability. Like if your people are decimated, you need a support system. And that was his way of creating one. But of course, in the Western narrative, like he's the last wild Indian and we have to capture all of, all of his knowledge. And so the way you view Ishii kind of speaks to orientation and how you tell stories, but most importantly, what information is garnered from those stories. And this is why in the beginning I said, it's most important that indigenous people are telling their own, own stories. And so if we have movements where indigenous practices are being spoken of, 
but indigenous people are absent, there is a problem. And so I thank you today for your time. I think that is my time and I welcome discussions. Um, I know we don't have question and answer, but thank you for having me. And this is my email if you wanna continue the conversation and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.